Hello, and welcome everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Nomen Art Jam. I hope you're all doing really, really well. Uh, my name is Josh Herman. I'm the CCO here at Nomen School of Visual Effects. Uh, today we're going to be having an art jam. Uh, in case you never joined an art jam before, we're going to be sculpting some stuff, having some fun, answering some questions in the chat if you have anything, and generally just kind of hanging out. Uh, let's just get started. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. I'm going to play a little bit of audio at the same time here, so you might be able to hear some of my background music, and we'll kind of get going with that. Uh, if there's any issues with the stream regarding sound, regarding anything like that, uh, picture, let us know so I can get in there and try to fix it as fast as possible. Um, this is a creature that I sculpted last week uh, with Alex Alvarez. Alex will be here at some point. His having some internet issues so uh we'll hopefully be able to get those resolved and we'll be able to have a dual stream uh but if there are any questions um or anything let me know i'm seeing that people are filtering it in the chat here uh so hello good to see you all um and we're just going to get started today Uh, this is a creature that we sculpted last week uh there was a request from the chat early in the, the stream, I guess, that uh, somebody had a, a creature they wanted to see from Monster Hunter. So I started sculpting that, which was actually pretty fun. And then I kind of evolved it into like more of a straight up kind of dragon. Uh, but what I wanted to do really quickly was actually recap. This is the second save of what I had made and to show you a little bit of the process of how I was doing this. So these are all of the pieces that I had kind of put into play. And you can see each one of these is a se separate element that I'm kind of at this point, point placing around uh, to get general shapes there. Uh, and then I eventually, uh, you know, kind of meander my way to the final result, which is here. So if, even if we select, you know, a piece like this uh, and we can kind of go back and forth, slowly evolving the, the piece over time. Uh, and the way that I do that is just by basically uh, focusing on areas that need improvement and, and trying to keep the whole uh, piece in play, the whole picture in play at, at a time. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what we're going to be working on today. And as I was working on this, I was really enjoying working on this piece. I think I want to keep working on this one a little bit further today. Uh, I might make something else, but we'll probably stick with this. So if there's any questions or anything as we get going, let me know. I did have this other piece that we had started in another stream, which is kind of this uh, alien-like thing. Uh, that we had done a while ago, which I was pretty happy with where that ended up as well. And I thought it could be interesting to do uh, some sort of a writer, uh, a weird alien writer, and maybe we could kind of bridge these two styles into a single style. Meaning if I just kind of screenshot this, we'll bring back in our dragon thing here. And if it was to be like sitting, you know, on this creature, at, uh, I don't know, about yay scale somewhere in here, maybe. Uh, that could be a fun thing to kind of put in there to kind of start bridging these gaps and making them uh, one piece. So that could be a fun thing that I think I want to explore today. Um, yeah. Otherwise, feeling pretty good about it. I think I might start with a warm up. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to grab a sphere. I'm going to leave all this stuff loaded. So if you guys want to follow along, what I like to do sometimes in, when I'm getting started in a, a project is just load up uh, something and just kind of get warmed up, get moving a little bit. So I'm going to just grab a sphere over here, take a look at this thing, hit X, make sure my symmetry is on. Seem to be, oh, that's because it's a not a poly mesh. We'll make it a poly mesh. Now we have our symmetry. I'm just going to start sculpting and making some shapes. At this point, what I'm really doing is I'm really just looking for shapes. I'm not really looking for anything specific. So I'm just going to start sculpting. Then what I'll do, especially for faces, I'll just kind of pull the front of a sphere down. And that'll kind of give a rough head shape. And from here, you can really do whatever you want. Meaning grab kind of the jaw, pull that out. Use a carving tool. I often will uh, actually sculpt the line down the middle. This is something I've seen a lot of traditional sculptors do. They just, you know, draw, basically plot out where their sculpt is going to go. Uh, and that can kind of help to visualize where some of this is going to happen. So even if I don't add a ton of resolution to this, um, I know that the eyes are probably going to go somewhere in here. Start carving in those areas, and this is a lot like what you see, you know, 
uh, 2D artists doing, right? Drawing the figure, plotting out where where things will be in proportion in space and uh, beginning to, to make those moves happen. Roughly get moving today before I get into my actual project because I'm enjoying that one and I don't want to noodle like aimlessly. I want to kind of have an intent and this is a good way to get your brain going creatively. Hopefully everybody's doing well out there. Just get a little jaw. So you can kind of quickly get, you know, a little bit of a, of a face to this somewhat quickly just by picking those lines that I sketched in and we're resembling a face and again this is very traditional style meaning i'm looking at it from this size on my screen even though i'm working probably around this size i'm looking at it at this size and just kind of evaluating the shape and that's a good way to get moving because the first read which is at a distance is going to be more important than the uh than the overall details that i'm adding especially right at the beginning so we're just going to keep getting some of this stuff going Hello, see a couple comments coming in the chat. Nice to see you all here. Happy Wednesday. Morning from Sideshow. Hello. Sideshow is awesome. Big fan of your work. Happy to see you here. So yeah, I'm just kind of get moving on this little sculpt. I'm not going to spend more than five minutes on this, but get my brain thinking about form. Get my brain thinking about sculpting, shapes, relationships, between all that kind of stuff. And uh, then we'll going I'm in here into dynamesh to kind of add a little bit more resolution to this and even just give it some detail you'll see now that it went from very little detail to a lot of detail but because of the resolution of the dynamesh it kept a lot of the planar shapes to it which is actually what i want because i want some of those harder planes in this sculpt so that now when i come in here with a, a brush that's got a little bit more detail I carve this in. Really know what I'm making here, but we can, uh, you know, like I said, we're not going to spend too much time on this. No, I have been uh, wanting to make a sculptor robot recently, which would be kind of fun. So we might explore that at some point today. Let's go straight to something like this. Just, whenever you remove the nose, it always helps quite a bit to make it feel more alien or something different, you know? these forms in here or just hide some of these get some of this this is probably enough Got a question from the chat. What is your suggestion for someone who's used, who's using and getting confused amongst Max and Maya and ZBrush at the same time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, stick with one for a little bit. I guess that's the quick answer I would give you is, you know, just stick with one. Um, get used to that before you try to diversify into multiples. Um, I think that Max and Maya are both great programs, but you can you can likely just pick one to learn. Um, it would be better to learn one of them, master one of them, than know both of them. I start with uh, one and then kind of progress from there. It looks like the Burger King. It's 
rip its mustache. Moving on this thing. All right, that'll be enough for this. We're gonna get back into our dragon here. So we're gonna jump over to our previous work. This is what we started on last stream. We actually started from nothing, but this is like save two, iteration two. Uh, and this is where we are now. And I think I will consider making this like some sort of a writer or person that would be on it with their uh, armor or something. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we keep working that, that this character and uh, this character may live in the same scene or ecosystem or sphere or something so that we can kind of uh begin comparing them scale wise not at the scale so i guess it might be helpful to scale this person down we just kind of put them here we'll bring this one i'm hitting shift s by the way shift s will snapshot something that's on your screen it basically places it on the canvas so that you can uh, continue working uh, but you can't edit what's on there anymore it's just kind of a different way to uh, to look at it all right. Yeah, I'm going to keep working on this thing, though. And maybe we'll get like a saddle and we'll, we'll add some ways that this character could eventually uh, sit on this character and get into some more pieces here. But we're going to focus on this character mostly in this area here. I, I kind of just want to resolve a little bit more um, what exactly this is and maybe push the design a little bit further. I think it's fine right now, but I think it could go we could go further uh another question from youtube uh which is more important for a digital artist knowing the tool or knowing the modeling uh i, I think when you're saying knowing the modeling that you're saying like knowing the foundations of of like modeling meaning form planes gesture rhythm etc uh and i would say that is more important than knowing the software and knowing the tool um you can learn all kinds of tools and there's all kinds of tools that can uh, be great for you, right? It just depends on what you're trying to do. And so that's why I think um, learning the tool is nice, but it's not gonna, you know, the tools are gonna change. They're always gonna change, especially in this industry. You know, over the past decade, if you look at the past 10 years, certain programs have, have gone away, certain programs have come into fashion and, and they all kind of uh, have their own life cycle that you eventually have to learn about so um fundamental is far more important than the tool i mean you can look at programs some people use so use some of these programs the programs like moto have kind of not disappeared but they're definitely not as used as they were you know five ten years ago I mean, like the one of the premier modeling programs or rendering programs still good not saying it's bad but uh just not as prominently used as it used to be I'm gonna load up this one this is what we i did a little exploration pre-stream on some like feathers or crest or something like this which i kind of like but I, I like it being a little more slender so uh this one and okay where am i looking this one yeah this is the neck adjustment that i just did to kind of pull it out a little bit give it a little more posture All right, so let's get into this face, I think. Let's start on the face. Uh, so as you see from a distance, uh, the way that I like to work in general, like if you're watching the stream for the first time or whatever, uh, the way that I like to work is I like to work at a distance. I work uh, slowly building up my forms uh, from primary forms, secondary forms, tertiary forms, and I slowly evolve the sculpt over time. Uh, what that means is at a distance, my goal is that it reads decent, decently well, reasonably well, before I progress to the next stage. And so if I hit V, um, of course, when I try to hit it, nothing happened because I, this has paint on it. But if I hit V, you'll get a sense of what the silhouette of the character is. And I'm looking for a strong silhouette right off the bat or something that's interesting at the very least. And I think for some parts of this, I'm achieving that. I think there's some areas of improvement that I want to improve as I move forward. Um, but generally it's working right uh there's other characters other creatures that we've done this with on stream so i'll just pull up a couple of them 
Uh, we ended up making a gremlin a while ago, or a type of a gremlin, right? So this is the character we made, and from a silhouette standpoint, there's good parts about this and there's bad parts about it, but generally, you can kind of see the approach of uh, where we end up with something. Now this one, again, you see that there's kind of this faceting on these areas of the sculpt, especially like in here. This is what I want to start removing as I step forward. Um, so let's go ahead and get into our creature here and start sculpting, right? So this is very low res. As we get closer, you'll see there's no way we can add detail. There's no way we can really do much of what we want. Uh, and I'd like to make this character um, somewhat resolved, but I also want to make it so that I can maybe open the mouth. I think that would be a really uh, interesting part of being able to do this character. Uh, and so right now that's why I have this sort of like lower jaw beak section so that we can kind of do this, right? Which is what this character would probably be doing uh, wherever its jaw would be, whether it's, you know, kind of here. I don't know if that's really it or if it's maybe more kind of further back here, wherever the hinge of this jaw is. Uh, I want to have this and that's why I have this extra piece of geo. So, um, what I'm thinking about right now is finding a, a place to split the mesh, meaning I want to focus on this character probably in here as a separate piece uh, at some point so that I can me uh, meld, weld, merge this jaw piece in to this bigger part while kind of uh, combining it all into a single element. So that's what I'm thinking through. There's not a great place to do that right now. But uh, we'll figure it out as we go. Because what I want to do right now is just up the whole thing. Uh, if I up the whole thing, I have to now sculpt all the rest of this body and this tail and all this other stuff um, to be roughly the same amount of, of quality that the rest of it is. I'm just going to continue pushing these shapes, keeping that in mind that at some point I want to break this off and I want to see if there's a place that I could almost create uh, an intersection where this figure that out at some point. I'm uh, some piece of something that went here that would be helpful. I just saw a glitch in the stream for some reason, so it looks like my internet may be not super helpful <laughs> right now. So let me know if there's any issues going on. This, I'd like to get this arm welded in. I'd like to get this beak welded in. I'd like to get this other leg welded in. This piece can hang on for a minute. I don't want to weld this in just yet. So I'll probably be working on something that looks more like this just for a little bit before we really progress. I do think the anatomy... You guys are just hearing me talk stream of consciousness, by the way. I do think the anatomy is at a place where I can merge it. The pose and the posture is at a place where I can merge it. I probably want to get some fingers and toes, though. So here's my plan. This is what I just decided. I'm going to uh, I'll give you a quick example. So here's what my plan is. I'm going to take what we have here. I'm going to merge the legs and the back legs and the front legs and the jaw into this piece. I'm going to dynamesh it all together. I'm going to sculpt on it for just a little, little bit so that I can... Um, get it to feel kind of okay. Then I'm going to dynamesh it again, and then I'm going to Z remesh the whole thing so that it has nice topology. Then we'll start going into a little bit more of the design phase and that polish. Um, eventually, we might want to retopologize this thing if we were going to go big, but I don't think we'll do that. So for now, let's uh, just merge it together and go from there. So this piece, however, will stay. All right, so we're going to go merge, and we're just going to go down. Okay. Okay, okay. This is now all the same uh, subtool, but you'll notice that in here, that these meshes are still separate. I am going to go ahead and I'm just going to dynamesh this whole piece. Okay. I want to make sure I'm not losing a ton of detail, and I'm also not welding pieces too tightly together. So you see some of those parts like in the mouth. 
I'm losing some of the little bits of detail. Not a ton. I am losing some detail that I'm not super happy about. So I'm just kind of observing the whole thing. This is not something I love, but we'll deal with that later. It's a dino. Yes, this is, looks very much like a dino, sort of. Um, I think we need to go a little higher on our projection. So we'll go 64. Is this welded in right now? No. Okay. There we go. That feels a little better than what we had. You can see it's capturing a little bit better of that information. It's not losing a ton of stuff. That mouth isn't getting completely welded together. And now as far as sculpting it together, uh, it actually doesn't need too much. I can, I can kind of come in with a, a brush and just start working. And I think I can actually just work from here. Maybe come in here and get some of these fingers though. What are these It's gonna look like, right? How long are they? I'm just using the snake hook brush. I'll just kind of hide them everything else and pull this out so maybe there's a picture that kind of goes like this do i like polygroups or modular modeling uh when you say modular modeling uh, dakota what are you asking about modular modeling do you mean poly modeling like traditional modeling and a package like Maya, or are you saying something different? For the question, by the way. Modular subtools. Oh, okay. Uh, I do both, meaning uh, sometimes I'll have them separately because they're easier to control, and then sometimes I'll have them in the same thing that I move around. Uh, Performance-wise, having them as, as sub-tools will be much better for you. So that's part of why I really like to use uh, sub-tools a lot. I also find that the intersection between two uh, pieces of geometry can create forms that are really difficult to sculpt. Um, so that's a part of why I actually kind of enjoy, um, you know, that element, I guess. Being able to just slap arms on or heads, you know, there's a lot of artists who kind of work this way, um, can be really helpful in creating your shapes. Let's get this hand going. Okay, that's going to be good. All right, what, we're, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, duplicate this whole subtool. This is an easy way in case that you're a, a beginner of the ZBrush, an easy way to kind of get new geometry that you can sculpt on that'll be a little better uh, for you. So what I like to do here is I'm going to duplicate this whole piece. have one here and one here. They look identical, so you can't see the difference, but I am switching, you can see over here. Uh, you can switch, by the way, using the up and down arrows on your keyboard. So one of these I'm going to select, I'm going to go to my geometry tab and I'm going to go to Z remesher. Uh, I'm likely going to choose something higher than five. This number here is the, if you hold down control on any of these, it'll tell you what it actually does. But this is uh, the number of thousands of polygons that you're going to aim for with, with your Z remesh. So if it's at five, it's 5,000 polygons. If it's 10, it's 10,000, etc. So when I hit Z remesh, you'll see the button up here, go across the top. And this number up here should be somewhere around 5,000, but it's not a perfect number uh, every time. This is a somewhat complicated, but not crazy complicated mesh. This is error encountered. Okay. Let's see what we can do about that. I'm wondering if it's some of these areas. Uh, overlapping and creating weird multiple times. Try to fill some of these holes. Let's 
There's another area back here, which is kind of interesting. That might be difficult for Tizzy Remesh. And what is difficult or what it finds to be difficult is um, it's kind of overlapping and intersecting and kind of doing this kind of thing. So when I'm smoothing this out, I'm, I'm trying to avoid what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to look for those areas. Let's try that Z Remesh one more time. We will be putting wings on that sucker. They're actually just hiding. Uh, I'm not putting them in right now because they'll be a little hard to control. So you this, see, this ended up actually being at like 20,000 and that's because 5,000 was not enough. It was not a high enough number for this thing to be usable. And so it actually did a pretty good job. There's some forms in here that are a little weird, but that's because the forms I sculpted were a little weird. Um, but generally it's done a pretty good job at um creating some nice geo for us now the what we can do is, is you can kind of take this in a couple ways uh oh here's the wings by the way this is the block out for the wings this is where we kind of started with this thing Alright, so we have this, which has some detail in it, and we have this, which is a lower polygon, but the, the polygons follow the form and follow the flow, right? So if we want any of this detail, we need to project it from this to this, our new mesh. So what I'm going to do uh, is I am going to um, save. First, I'm going to save. Rename this to uh, something. So we're going to go ahead and add uh, some subdivisions. So I'm just going to go to Geometry. I'm going to hit Divide. You can hit con uh, Control D as well. All right, but you'll see it's going to start smoothing out this form. So I th now this is about 76,000 polygons. And so I'm going to go to my other one. I'm going to see this is 500,000 polygons. So we'll see how well this projection holds up. I'll probably add one more level of projection. So we're at 300,000. What I typically try to do is... Um, take the it, the mesh that's going to be projected to and put it roughly around the same amount of polygons as what the, the detailed mesh has. So if the detail mesh has 500,000 polygons, I try to get my Z remeshed mesh to have about 500,000. Here, I'm at 300. That'll be fine. So what I do is I just go down into project and I hit project all. Uh, I don't have to... One thing I, I do real quick is I go ahead and I make a morph target. I'll explain that if there's any issues, but I'll show you what it does anyways. So we go in here, we have our, I'm going to hide these wings because we don't want to project the wings. All right. And so we have this and this. I'm going to be on this one and I'm going to hit our project all button. It'll take a little time, but not too much time. So now you can see this is actually uh for the projection and this is after the projection so it doesn't look like it had any geometry shooting off into the void somewhere right it's uh just working normally and so now you can see this to this this is the slightly more detailed one and this which is going to be probably a little hard to see on the stream but there's one that has just a little bit more detail than the other one the other ones are totally fine right that means I can actually come in here and you'll see this is the nice mesh. So we'll come into like the face area and you can see how the geometry, I also have subdivisions, which is a huge thing for UVing and texturing, etc. Uh, but if I, you'll see this is a nice mesh here, whereas this one is kind of a gross mesh of what we have, even though the deep, the form itself looks very similar. So we're in a much better place to begin sculpting, except for this. What is this? Looks like there was a hole that we didn't know about. This is going to be a problem. Another thing there. This is something we should have checked in our Z remesh. I thought it was looking fine. Go through and kind of just smooth this character out really quickly and see if there's any other holes. Uh, we can't actually 
start sculpting until this is resolved. So all that projection stuff I did has to be redone. I'm gonna undo all this. Undo, 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 undo. All right, so this is this. I need to figure out why this is happening. That's fine. I'll smooth this out. That's fine. And we'll uh, see how this goes. I don't know why I had one here. That was really odd. So I'm just going to subtly smooth that down. With that, I need to one more. I'm going to get some of these little pieces uh, to go away. Right, you see these little floating pieces like this? We don't want Z Remesher to catch those. If Z Remesher catches those, it's going to try to, you know, force them into some piece of geometry, and we don't want that. So I'm taking Dynamesh here, and I'm just smashing this stuff to the surface. There, go. there it is. It's a little more technical work than we normally do here in art jam but that's fine it's nice to see the reality not every piece of production is just open on for an hour or three hours that's really not how it works all right so now we're going to do our z remesh one more time that we fixed those problems we'll see how this works arf yes it is the same character we're creating from last stream all right let's see how this is going An interesting comment about uh, carpal tunnel. Uh, I don't really have any wrist issues, hand issues. I know some artists that have uh, have had them. Oh, that's not symmetrical at all, is it? That's because I didn't have symmetry on. Maybe Let's turn some symmetry back on. Hit this. Um, Alex is having some connection issues, so we're hoping that we can get him on the stream stream soon. If not, it'll just be a solo stream, and he'll be back next week. There we go, that seems a little better, symmetry-wise. Uh, if you don't have symmetry on when you start doing this, it will not make your z mess symmetrical. So I'm smoothing this all out to a pretty extreme degree because I'm looking for holes. I wanna check that there's no issues because I didn't do that last time and it kind of bite. See this nice retop. So we're going to come back in here again. We're going to add our two subdivision levels. We're going to go back here. We're going to make our morph target. This is what we did last time. Hit store. Go back into our sub tool again and project from this. It doesn't take long at all. So this is the before. This is the after. You see it's roughly the same shape, but it's capturing all those extra little details, which is great. All right. And now we can actually begin sculpting a higher res character uh not just because we can add more detail but it's kind of the, the distribution of where the geometry is which is helping it be a little bit more um interest uh, easier to sculpt on Uh, things that this is also great for is now that there are subdivisions, I can kind of come in here and make it way easier to polygroup. You can polygroup in Dynamesh, and we actually were doing it. So if you look at like uh, this, you see that there are polygroups. A little messier. Some of these were because they were multiple meshes, mesh, Dynameshed into one mesh. That's a lot of the word mesh, but uh, that's kind of how it was done before. This way, I can come in here. We'll actually delete this piece because we don't need this anymore. This is the old mesh. Delete. Note that it's not an undoable action in ZBrush, so be really careful when you're un when you're deleting things uh, because it will. Get it. If I hit Control W, you can see I've made a poly group this way, and what that does is it makes it really easy to be able to quickly uh, kind of sort through your mesh, your your geo here and uh, make it easy to work on. 
those those uh, lines are gonna be really clean. It's okay. We'll get this tail. Now what I can do, what this is letting me do, is I can quickly isolate sections. So if I just want to work on the torso, right, and see what this is looking like, I can do that. If I want to look at it, you know, without the tail, I can do that. If I just want to isolate and work on the head, I can work on just the head. And this is kind of the power of what polygroups really do for you. And I still have all those subdivision levels. So it's really easy to adjust. It's also going to be way easier to texture UV in the future if we ever wanted to do that. So it's a really great um, thing to do. All right. So we're going to save that now that we've got that. We can begin sculpting. Now what I can do, because I have, have this added detail, uh, one of the benefits of this is the detail actually flows in the direction of where the sculpt was going, meaning I'm not kind of crossing the opposite angle, right? I'm going with parallel to whatever I was sculpting. Uh, so if I sculpt a line this way, right, I can actually, the geometry will fold in the right way rather than trying to do it kind of uh, this way, like if I sculpt a line this way. It looks extra faceted because it's trying to fold polygons the way that they don't normally go, right, from uh, corner to corner. Because this appears to be a, a better line than this appears to be, just because of the direction of the flow of the polygons. And that's why you use Z-Remesh. I get a lot of questions about that, like, why are you? Why are you Z-Remeshing in general? Yeah. All right, so we can start sculpting now. Got to figure out where these eyes are going to go at some point. What this head is going to look like. I like this shape that's been created here. It looks very bird-like, and that's something I like. But I'd like to to kind of move away from that if possible, and kind of make it a little bit less obvious. I think the overall shape of the bird is is cool. Uh, but I do want to try to avoid it just looking like a big bird head. So some things we could do. I had kind of explored, you know, doing... Uh, I think I had showed you the previous one where it was like, you know, we could do some things like this. Just really get into some different types of motifs. Um, but, Yeah. We've got a couple new people and a couple new comments. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, what am I making? Good question. I'm making a, a dragon creature today. We're working on a dragon creature. We worked on this last stream. Um, so we're kind of getting into that. Of course, as you say that, I'm also, I had said at the beginning of the stream, I'm interested in bouncing back and forth on other projects uh, today. So I'm, I'm still debating that, even though we're 40 minutes into the stream. I kind of want to start on another character. I have, like, a bad habit of starting other characters and working on other things. So, uh, But sometimes it's more fun to start something from scratch. Uh, so that's what I'm really trying to choose right now. Uh, do I have a dark art style? Oh, that's interesting. I've never really thought about that. Maybe. Maybe I do. Like I think that cert I definitely gravitate towards uh, certain types of things. Maybe a spaceman. I was thinking about doing a robot, and that was something I haven't sculpted in a long time. And I've done a lot of robots before. And I've been doing a lot of creatures in this in this stream. Like I think if we look at a lot of the stuff um, that I've done on stream, like I think I showed the the little gremlin, you know, the little different types of things. A lot of them tend to be. I guess darker I mean, creatures, characters, aliens. So maybe we would make something that's more hard surfacey. I'm enjoying this, and I will definitely come back to it. I'm almost seeing this like uh, when I, what I one of the things I like to do is like world build, right? So I really enjoy world building. 
and uh, thinking of all these little characters that I make and kind of putting them in the same place, same world. So like I was saying earlier, like this could be a creature, a writer, you know, this could be this, right? Those could go together and we made this little creature, this little imp. And so this thing can be like this big, in the, all in kind of the same world. Right. And then many of the other characters we've made could probably fit in there as well. So we did this, uh, what was one that I liked? This guy was all right. Have this, you know, sort of uh, character. So he could be like, yay, big. Looks like he's like shorter. These are all kind of in the same world. And I'm imagining it, you know, at some point I would love to do a project where they, they have their own personalities beyond just the quick sculpts that we do. Uh, on our jam, they can kind of be tied up into one bigger project and stuff like that. So that's that's a thing I'd like to do at some point, but I need to kind of focus down and really figure out what the points or what they are. Uh, I've been working on a project. I would really like to do a cast, and I've been debating the idea of doing the 2021 project. I know it's already March, which is insane to think about, but doing a 2021 project uh, of combining several characters into doing a cast. Uh, I really, I don't know if any of you guys, y'all, have ever explored TV Tropes. TVTropes.org. I show this to a lot of people, uh, but TVTropes.org is an amazing website where you can really get into, like, this basically all the, the tropes and styles of things that happen uh, in pop culture. Uh, so one of that I look like look for quite a bit is called the five man band i don't know if you guys can even see this text but five man band is a trope and it basically breaks down into five people that make up you know your classic or many classic uh team dynamics so if i think like the x-men is probably a five man band uh there's also other types of these that are like the four temperament ensemble which is more like uh, Avatar, for example. Avatar, the last airbender is a four temperament ensemble. So kind of looking at this type of stuff and thinking like, what would each of these characters be? And so I have a, uh, I have a four, temp four temperament ensemble in my things of things that I want to do. And I've kind of blocked out what those characters would be. So I think that would be a fun project to work on. So TV Tropes is a, uh, a, a dark hole that you can go down. <laughs> it's really fun to do. Uh, I really enjoy like exploring all this kind of stuff. Uh, but it is uh, it can be stuck for sure. But it's fun. It gives you insight into like how uh, different things work. Which I, I like kind of exploring that kind of stuff. All right. Um, so I was kind of saying, like, you know, we could start sculpting on this face. We could put the, this character on here. Or we could jump into another character. Somebody said a spaceman. Saying robot. I'm thinking I, I want to make a, a robot, like an android. I haven't made an android in a long time. I think that's something I would be interested in doing. Somebody is asking, uh, the same person, W really from Twitch, you know, that asked if I have a dark art style, what kind of principles would define it a dark art style? That's a really great question. Um, I don't know if I have a dark art style. I think it's, if it, if it is, maybe a little bit. I think if I had to, I don't think I... I am there yet, but I think as far as art style is concerned, I kind of like, um, what's the right word? Like cult, cult, like pop. What's the word I'm looking for? Not pop culture, but um, like cult comics and type of stuff. I, I really enjoy that type of thing. So maybe it's sort of, that's the sphere that we're kind of, that you're seeing. Android is one of your first sculpts ever. That's awesome. All right, you said it. You or you you said enough to make me be excited to work on an Android. So let's work on an Android for a little while. So that means it's gonna be humanoid. You need to define what it's gonna be made of. I think the setting that it would be made in 
full disclosure, one of the characters I'd be working on in this four temperament ensemble would be an android. So the setting, I think, should you know bring in some not just metal, but I like the the kind of the golem style of android, meaning they're like made from wood and leather and metal and you know kind of stuff like that. So maybe we'll find something that's got a little bit of an older uh, style to it. Uh, pull up my art station here to kind of show you one of the first quote unquote androids that I really worked on was uh, this Silver Surfer piece, and so this one. It's kind of what I'm thinking when I did this piece that there was sort of this art deco sort of uh, attempting to, sh to shoot for like a, a beautiful elegance to the character. So I was using a lot of art deco and lines that were kind of overlapping. So I'd like to bring back some of this to whatever I make today. So this is something I'm kind of keeping in mind. Uh, also, when I worked on Ultron, that was another character that has a lot of these lines and things that overlap. So that's something I want to be paying attention to. I don't want it to be super blocky and square, even though that could be an interesting element, trying to combine those two. So let's kind of keep those things in mind with, um, with that as we move forward. Johnny Boy from Twitch is saying you're working on a Silver Surfer character too. That's awesome. We're Silver Surfer-like character. They're fun characters. They're hard to work on. Uh, the biggest challenge from working on a character like this uh, was it was a redesign. And, and realistically, when you look at this character, Norn Rad or Silver Surfer, uh, he's essentially a, a nude silver dude. And um, to translate it, that into something that feels different um, or it is different is kind of hard because you uh, to keep the iconography and the graphic of what this character looked like um, and still advance on it or try to, to add new elements to it is actually really hard and I got a and this got posted around which was cool um, when other people like your art that's awesome uh, but I got a lot of hate comments which I thought was really funny People really disliked this. Either people really thought it was cool uh, or people really disliked that I had kind of gone in this uh, technical, mechanical Android look. They, a lot of people really hated it, which I thought was actually really funny. Uh, so it's a challenge to redesign a character and push it too far away um, because people, other people don't always respond to it. But that's I think it's more important if you care about it. All right, what am I doing? I'm looking for a base mesh to start from, I think. Yeah? All right, chat, what do you think? Should we start from scratch? Should we start from a sphere? Or should we start from something like we've started on before? Should we start from like one of these heads and start building it out? Or should we go from a full base mesh? What would be the most interesting way to see something get made? It, I would probably use something like this for a base mesh. Or from the head. So we got one vote for the head. If there's any other votes, let me know. One vote for a head start. Make it an Android today. From scratch, of course. Make it from scratch. We got two votes for from scratch. Body base mesh. We're seeing a little bit of everything. Base mesh, base mesh. Hmm. From scratch would be neat. I think from scratch is coming in the most. Mm, excuse me. So we're going to do that. All right. Sphere. We're going to go ahead and make this a poly mesh. There's a bunch of things to do in here. I am going to uh, actually clear out my ZBrush because there's a lot of these tools in here and ZBrush's auto save doesn't just save the individual tool that you're working on. It uh, it saves everything that's in your project and so it's actually gonna slow us down quite a bit. And since we're starting over from scratch, I'm just gonna go in here, hit initialize, basically gonna wipe out everything. Uh, it also another way I could do that is I could go in here and say like start from one of these 
So we'll, we'll just do this one. Get this uh, thing out of here. I think that's the cam view. Turn off the cam view. And uh, let's go to this. Something that's got a little warmth to it to start. Put a little bit of that wax modifier on it. Well, it's going to be hard surface. So we don't really need that. And somebody said full send it. Go from a sphere. I'll go down a little bit. I'm going to go to 32. The reason I go this low is so that I can adjust the shapes broadly, more broadly than I can the other way. So part of the character, I mean, in case you've never joined Art Jam before or haven't seen many of the things that we've made before, I am a really big d, &D fan. Uh, big, big PTRPG tabletop role-playing game fan uh, and one of the this inspiration came from the Warforged which Warforged is a style of basically of a golem or android in the D&D universe and I think they're cool looking and I was thinking about making my own version of this type of character but I really dislike their faces I was telling some friends I just don't like the style of what this face has been created just kind of uh, very golemy, which is I think obviously the intent I kind of like things like this that are a little bit more uh, humanoid in the face so I want to kind of replicate that element uh, with this character um, that will kind of bring in a human-ish element um, if anybody has seen Mortal Engines uh, there's a really awesome android in there called Shrike uh, made by uh, Andrew Baker who's a really talented uh, concept artist that used to work at, at Weta I thought that was an interesting one. What am I working on? I'm about to start an Android right now. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're going to work on. We're working on an Android from scratch. Of all the art studios you have worked for, which was the most impressive? Which was the most impressive? Uh, impressive in which way? Which way are you asking? In like the work they did, their office, you know, I don't know. It's a tough, it's a tough one. They're all, every studio I've worked for is impressive in its own right. So I guess if you have a question, I can just tell you what was impressive about each of them. What are my thoughts about crypto art? I think crypto art is a really fascinating uh, thing that's going on right now. Um, I think there's, you know, the element of owning digital artwork, I think is really cool. You know, somebody is the official owner of it. The money that's going around is insane, like actually insane, but it's cool. It's really cool. Uh, what are my creative work free flowing? Yeah, okay, I'll show the aspects of each. Uh, looks like there's a question about Furio Tedeschi's uh, artwork. Furio's awesome. I actually worked with him at uh, Cloud Imperium Games. Uh, he came over, uh, worked with us for about a year or so before he went to CD Projekt Red. He's a great artist, though. Cool work for sure. Um, what's the most creative or the most free-flowing? They're all kind of like that, but I'll just kind of talk through the big ones that I've worked at. So uh, in case you're just joining the stream and you've never seen anything I've ever done before or know nothing about what I'm talking about, uh, this is my art station. You can check it out here. Droids for Sale is my uh, thing. I even 
and put this over here so on the chat you can see my name at droids for sale that's how you can find me in there or also on instagram um i ended up starting my career at a place called legacy effects uh so that's what some of these pieces uh, down here are from the movie real steel so noisy boy and ambush and stuff like that adam which is the main character there so uh, they did a lot of practical work right meaning they're they are a practical effects house and so uh, me working on avengers and stuff this is a physical print 3d print a statue of that uh so there's a lot of cool stuff that i did there so i guess one of the best aspects of working at legacy we'll start from there um was being able to work uh in practical their you know, legacy has a really awesome uh, they're formerly known as stan winston studios i don't know if i call Oh, hello. I think we're back. Are we back here? Sorry, my internet decided to pass out. We're good. All right, good to see you all again. Hello. Uh, just weird internet blip, so I switched my other uh, router, and it seems to be fine. One of those weird internet days. I don't know if anybody has those where you're just like, well, I'm uh, just not going to do anything on the internet today and I'm going to go read a book. I'm liking the idea of this character being a little, like almost knight-like in its, in its construction, like square, square top. Let's explore that first. All right, uh, what was I talking about? Legacy Effects, that's right. Legacy Effects is where I started working. They did a lot of practical work, formerly known as Stan Winston Studios. And um, the interesting thing about there is, first off, formerly known as uh, Stan Winston. Stan Winston has a huge pedigree of working on amazing projects like Jurassic Park and Avatar. And um, I'm blanking on so many of them, but Alien, Aliens, excuse me, uh, Predator, uh you know, Batman Returns, like a ton of really, really cool projects. Terminator, of course, uh, all the Terminators. And so, you know, just being able to work at a studio that's done that and knowing that many of the key, actually the four owners have worked essentially on all those projects and they have this really great um, pedigree and history of working on these amazing films at a very high degree. Uh, but in a practical sense, uh, I had graduated from Noman and Noman obviously is a, a CG, right? A 3D focused school. And so going and leaving uh, Noman to work at a CG or sorry, a practical focused company was a very unique experience because they, um, they were just very different, right? It was, it was a, a completely different process right you don't you don't have to texture things you don't have to care about your topology because you're going to do 3d printing like there's a lot of odd uh things that kind of ended up happening I want this care to be wider that could maybe be like um but it was just very different and i think that was the biggest part of that i, I learned at legacy was just kind of a different way to learn a different way to explore um to think about something in a practical manner rather than thinking something purely in a digital way and what you could do in a digital realm. Uh, 
So that was uh, you know, working in 3D printing is something I really love and actually want to get back into at some point. So that was something that like I would like to do again. Um, but yeah, very cool. That was you know, that was a really cool element of of legacy. Um, Sorry, just making sure I don't miss any comments. Uh, no, I've never used an iOS sculpting app. They seem cool, but I've never really used one. Um, next, after that, I worked at Naughty Dog, uh, which is very different, right? Going from a practical company with a long pedigree, which Naughty Dog also has a long pedigree, but to work on a games at a game company in something that's very um, photo real yet stylized hand sculpted like very interesting way that that's all kind of done um, you know working in engine working in version control working in you know things like perforce proprietary engines proprietary shading like everything was, was proprietary at um at Naughty Dog, and so that was a really interesting way to kind of get into games, right? Uh, so the best part about you know, some of the coolest parts about Naughty Dog is everybody just really, really cares. They they really care about the project. Um, you know, they they really want it to be the best. You know, there's sort of this comments about crunch and stuff like that, but I think when you're super passionate about a project or or something. Sometimes you're okay to work extra hours to make it better. You know, it's not always about it being a nine to five. And um, I think that's what Naughty Dog kind of taught me was that you know, just the passion that some people have for their work really exceeds you know, the, some what others have, I guess. And so that they're arguably the most passionate group that I've worked for. Really excellent. After that, I worked at Marvel Studios. Marvel, um, I'm just kind of making shapes right now. None of this is, by the way, is will be the final. I'm just exploring um, what these big blocks could be, whether they're connected by wires, whether they're connected by something else. doesn't really matter right now. I'm just kind of getting the relationship of the head, torso, head, whatever, uh, rib cage, and then pelvis kind of connected. It will likely change entirely from this at some point, but so you know as I'm talking. Um, Marvel prior to Disney ownership, yes. Uh, I worked there before the Disney ownership, but then I also worked there during as well. Uh, so when we first started, when I first started working at Marvel, we were working down actually at uh, Raleigh Studios, which is uh, down in Manhattan Beach in Los Angeles. It's actually now where Lightstorm, which is uh, James Cameron's company, uh, is heading up all the Avatar productions. So we were we used to be down there, and then they ended up moving us after the acquisition to uh, Burbank to work on the Disney lot. So I got to work in the Frank G. Wells building, which was awesome. Historic lot, obviously. Um, but Marvel, one of the things that they do really well is... Um, very passionate as well. I think, you know, very similar. All, realistically, every company that I've worked at uh, is passionate about what they work on. I'm not trying to say any of them are not. Um, but very interesting to see the, the care in the pre-production environment, really making sure, wanting to make sure that everything is excellent, is as good as it possibly can be. I think that was what I liked you know, really caring about everything down to the minute, smallest detail um, is something that I, I learned at Marvel and I think is probably one of the best parts about the, that company is, is how everything, every little element from the design side, obviously, is what I'm talking about, um, matters. I was just exploring this idea of like a trunk skeleton Starting with that and seeing how this goes. Let's see. We'll see where it goes. Um, but they're fantastic. I worked for them for five years. 
After that, I worked at uh, Cloud Imperium Games. Cloud Imperium is a, also a very unique company. I think all the four of the big companies I've worked at are, are unique, being the record Guinness, you know, Guinness Book of World Records setting uh, company for biggest Kickstarter ever made, being an open development, which is very unique. Uh, whereas, you know, at Naughty Dog, also going back into games here, working a different engine using a uh, lumberyard or cry engine, depending. And, um, Working in open development is a completely different experience. You know, having Naughty Dog and Marvel where you're not allowed to say anything about what you work on for so, so long. Uh, whereas Cloud Imperium was, you know, every week we're talking about projects, the update to, you know, a character model that we're working on, showing concept art. Um, very, very, you know, just that alone changes the the dynamic of how you work and what you do and what you think about and you know taking feedback from not just you but also the community and so you know all four of the companies i've worked at are, are very different in the way that they kind of function or their their structure um it's kind of hard that's why it's hard to say like what's the best one just because they're entirely different even between big budget companies you know big budget AAA companies game companies like you know Naughty Dog and Cloud Imperium uh, um, completely different ways to work uh, Cloud Imperium has five offices right so there's offices in all across the globe three in Europe and two in the US Actually, I think now there's six because there's one in Canada. It's more like a pelvis shape where it's kind of like a carve in. I'm kind of enjoying this like almost skeletal look. It will very likely build stuff on top of this. Uh, this is one way that I kind of like to work, which is basically uh, treating it a lot like an action figure, meaning uh, or, or building inside out is a, a way that I like to work as well. Well, you start with one piece right and then you put it on top so you've got the the mannequin with no accessories on it right uh and then you put the the clothes on and you put the backpack on and you put the armor on and you put the helmet on and you put all the all the extra stuff so the way that i'm kind of working at it now is like what is the most stripped down uh element of this right what does this thing look like I, you know just want to create a uh single piece what could it look like what would it, what would it do how would it function uh, so I'm, right now as far as looking at like a robot that's kind of what I'm and knowing that's an android I want it to be humanoid I want it to follow the follow that um, how how would it connect how would it function how would it rotate so that's why I'm right now I'm very clearly mimicking the skeleton uh, but it's a good place to start usually I don't know if I'm going to do this whole like, you know, Terminator style thing like I could, right? It's easy to do that, but I don't know if that's necessarily the way that I want this to function. In this world, there's also magic. Let's say there's magic in this Android world. So maybe that's an element that we can have where it doesn't have to connect with wires and metal and stuff like that. We can find other ways to make it function. get some arms in there I am gonna bring in a base mesh for an arm uh, the reason is just because I don't want to have to go through every little digit I think actually you know what I said I'd do this from scratch let's do this from scratch into cube cube along with that skeletal idea for a little bit yeah you go an elemental android uh, i think you know in culture that might be even just like a golem golem is a creation right a magical creation a magical construct of some kind so i don't want this to be like a big hulking thing but um yeah i want it to be different at some point right now we're just blocking out shapes like this is 
I think it's important to note that almost nothing here will be in the final. Uh, this is just the, it's like a sketch, right? I always go into Photoshop or bring out my, my uh, you know, pen and paper and start sketching. And this is, this is what I'm thinking about as far as what the shapes are. I'm also kind of looking at this. You can look at it either way. The, the silhouettes, how it's going to function in that, that manner. Which type of elemental? See, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Like, what is it that's powering this? Really good question. Uh, the character that I had kind of talked about was um, would be powered by fire. It would be a fire-themed character. So that's something we could play with, right? We could keep running with that fire style. Uh, we're using ZBrush, by the way. Your text is so dark blue, it's hard to see. Maytina, I think, from Twitch. Uh, we're using uh, ZBrush today. Make like a little joint for this. We're just going to sculpt this around. I really like breaking down uh, characters into like what their core functions are. Another project that I did this on was uh, this IG88 that I did. So it says two renders. There's one that's like more of a, a just general pass of what the character looks like. All right. So kind of taking these elements and like how would this character function, redesigning this kind of stuff. So this is kind of my approach that I'm going to be getting to eventually. And then like a more uh, you know, moody lighting. But we'll get to this at some point. So, but we've just defined a little bit. I said I want there to be a little bit of an elegance to it. I do want to explore the idea of it being smaller. And I think there's... You're going to make a golem. You're going to make these creations of some type. It's kind of like, realistically, it's similar to like uh, Blade Runner, right? Like Blade Runners, the replicants, they, they're more powerful than humans in essentially every regard, but they put a lifespan on them. Because they know that that's an issue. That these things could become more powerful than them make groups separate here so I can uh, any good book recommendations to learn a, anatomy for a beginner absolutely let me find my books I have some of my favorite ones over here unfortunately my cord is just long enough that I can get all the way over to my bookshelf, which I now have another bookshelf in the back, which I'm pretty stoked about. All right, let's get this one. These are probably my two, three favorites. All right, we're back. All right, a couple books that I would recommend. First off is going to be Bridgman. Bridgman is one of my favorite books of the human machine. He's a really talented, uh, was a very talented uh, figure drawing instructor and has a ton of these books. This is his name. George B. Bridgman. So check these out. They're really great ways to uh, kind of study the, the characters, study the fundamentals, um, you know, make sure that everything is planar. He's really good at, at constructing and making things very planar and, and teaching you about planes and forms. So especially if you're interested in sculpting, definitely recommend uh, the Bridgman books. There's a ton of these, so check those out. Uh, the, my other favorite book, and this is more about figure drawing. You'll notice that a lot of my favorite uh, books are about figure drawing for learning anatomy. So you want to learn this. This is uh, Michael Hampton's figure drawing design and invention. This is a really fantastic book because it also breaks down. Uh, it has really nice illustrations in it to begin with, but he actually goes into both the construction of anatomy. It has nicely detailed illustrations uh, that will help you. Uh, there we go. More in focus there um, that help you kind of understand the anatomy, but also getting into how to do posing, how to do general proportions uh, and it's more from an artist perspective so it's not about learning just you know the 
this is just some gesture work obviously but uh, it's not just about the muscle names and all that kind of fun stuff so that is my two those are my two uh, book recommendations for somebody that wants to learn that and hello it looks like we have alex has joined our stream or it looks like we're sorting out our internet connection issues i'm going to add you to the stream alex hello hello we've made it looks like our internet we i had an internet issue earlier yeah it's just one of those days it seems like man just like an hour of uh working not working yeah it's so annoying called and then of course like i call tech support for like you know the internet here and on hold and then once you know this lady finally picks up it starts working <laughs> So it's basically worked since because <laughs> I knew you called. Yeah, and she's like, "Yeah, seems like everything's fine, oh, fine in your neighborhood." I'm like, "I promise, for the last hour, it's just not been working." So, I think just uh, trust me, please. Well, welcome. But uh, yeah, how's it going? Good. I was working on that little dragon I worked on yesterday, and then I decided I'm going to make an android. So that was what I uh, pivoted to, and I'm starting kind of at like you know. The skeletal structure of what this thing would be made of so I'm just getting going cool but, yeah at least i have my music still on i can keep it on a little bit i guess but i think when uh you end up sharing your chat your screen will uh have to lose the music because it'll pop back and forth oh right okay and, and i'm getting some more internet issues that's saying my something about my internet is slowing down so we'll see how today goes a speed test <clears throat> i saw you were uh recommending some yeah. books yeah this is one of my favorites michael michael hampton's i'm gonna go this way again but like michael hampton's this figure drawing book is i have recommended this and bought this probably four or five times like i love this I book it's one of my one. favorites it's a good one i have a few bridgman books bridgman's great yeah bridgman's awesome I used to love Bern Hogarth way back when. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, his books are super cool. He taught at Art Center when uh, when I was there, and he passed away like two terms before I was supposed to have him as a teacher. Oh wow, which was a huge bummer. Yeah. Mirror these over. There we go. And then it's his son Michael lens. for a long time. Did you ever have Michael? Right. I never did, no. Michael Hogarth. I remember seeing the name on the roster, like on the schedule or whatever. Andrew Loomis, yeah. He's also awesome. Oh, definitely Loomis, yeah. Um... They're asking you if you have any books on environments. What uh, things do you recommend? From an instructional perspective, not really. I have a lot of you know books on landscape photography and architectural photography and architecture. So I definitely have uh, lots and lots of books I've collected over the years, and lots of fantasy art books, obviously that um, are endlessly inspiring for environment stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, off the top of my head, nothing specific. Because I, I just find, like you know, lately, you know, meaning like thanks to the internet, mm. so much inspiration comes from that. You know, yeah. And just looking at photography of places, I tend to look more at photography though than I do at uh, um, people's artwork. You know, mm -hmm. I find that uh, the problem with looking at people's artwork is that you don't want to be too derivative. But if you look at photography, you're just being inspired by nature. Yeah. But I for sure think like the number one thing to do if somebody wants to be get into environment stuff is to travel and get into photography. Mm -hmm. All right. Looks like you got your mind up. I'm going to kill my music as we switch over to you. What are you making over there? We're working on. Um, 
Nothing yet. I just got to switch gears from uh, tech, internet tech support to uh, this. But I was, gonna, <laughs> uh, let's see. I was going to just show, oh, yeah. you know, where I got to on the stream last week, you know, and then I, I did play with it some more last Wednesday night. And so last week, uh, basically got to this point where I just blocked out things in Maya, but I didn't really have time to think about lighting. And so the only lighting that's in here was just an HDR mm. and, uh, which still looks, you know, like an overcast day, but, uh, then I thought I'd play with the lighting. And so this is, uh, how I changed the lighting after the stream. So I just thought I'd show it since it changed a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, but you can see if you compare the two, like even though it looks super different, like the camera's in exactly the same spot, the geometry is all pretty much the same, but you can mm -hmm. see if I said to kind of compare the two, changed the lighting, added more fog, um, added a couple more trees back here. Um, but uh, just so it felt like there was a little bit more story to it. Because mm -hmm. I think this feels more just like a snapshot, like you're just going on a hike with a friend and it's a random picture. Well, you know, this one feels more like there's uh, something's going on. And yeah. I think that kind of makes, I don't know, I, f I feel like that's uh, if I'm doing environment stuff and just messing around, I'm at some point going to try and add something that makes it feel like there's an event even mm -hmm. though i have no idea what that event is in here because i just sort of did it randomly mm -hmm. but uh but yeah so that that's kind of what i did i feel like going to jump into maya i think uh open the render view window you can see this is what this scene looks like without any fog at all and so it shows that uh, just by disabling fog, it makes such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I go and enable fog and enable the uh, depth of field on my camera, let's go inside here. And then go into render globals, go to the environment fog and enable that then ultimately it's just gonna render slower. So I tend to mm. turn that stuff off if I'm blocking out position of objects and blocking out lighting, but then ultimately to really finish the lighting, you need to have that stuff on because it has such a huge impact. Mm -hmm. But you can see now it's a little slower than what we were seeing last week. But I haven't touched yeah. this file last Wednesday. So I'm kind of like letting my brain reacquaint myself to yeah. where I was at. Absolutely. That's why I did like a little warm up this morning. Just kind of sculpt, just do something that kind of get yourself, you know, like you were saying, out of, out of tech support mind, like out of other things and kind of just like set yourself into it. it really yeah. Cause me. I mean, it's just, my internet was working this morning and then right when I was supposed to like join you, it died. And so of course then, you know, that's an hour of being a little amped. I'm just like, what's going on? Turn off the router, unplug the mm -hmm. router, restart everything. It's so frustrating too. It's happening. But Why? I know, man. But it's pretty um, warm over here. Yeah. It's raining over here, so I'm wondering if that's what it was for me. Oh, the really? Rain if, yeah. Oh, weird. It's sunny out here. Uh, I've got a question. It seems like two that are sort of talking about Maya and older artists, I guess. But one is asking, <laughs> says they wish you could use Maya. I heard it was age restricted, 40 to 80 only. I don't think it's age restricted. That's uh, a pretty funny comment. Yeah. And then the other one is uh, thoughts about when is the best time to get into the 3D industry? Do you have any thoughts on that in general? When is the best time to get into the 3D industry when oriented towards older artists? Um, well, the time to get into it is when you want to get into it. There's no right time to do anything, really. I think if you're interested in learning about something, you start learning about it. Um, I don't think anybody really pays attention to age. You know, I think people pay attention to your personality and they pay attention to your work, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember 
You know, back when Noman uh, started, we had a student, extension student, Donna Bates. She was uh, in her 50s and uh, was an illustrator and uh, completely 2D and traditional media and uh, studied at Noman as an extension student. And then has, you know, within a few years was a CG supervisor. Hmm. So I think, uh, you know, and now Donna is... I assume in her seventies and still making art and posting on Instagram and being super busy. And she, you know, just has the passion and enthusiasm of, you know, something someone that we would associate as being younger. But the thing is, is that I've known a lot of older artists, um, you know, like when Sid Mead did his DVDs with Noman, he was mm -hmm. in his seventies and incredibly passionate and excited and, and aware of everything that was going on with tech and software and 3d. And, um, you know, we're working with Ian McKegg on some stuff right now, and I'm not sure how old Ian is, but I'm going to say maybe 60, you know, and if there's somebody who's got passion. It's that guy, you oh, know? Yeah. So I, I think we've had older students and I don't think it matters. You know, I yeah. think it's, uh, I think there's a level of intimidation people have where they know they're going to be around younger people and they're going to be a little self-conscious of being older. Um, but by being older, you have a little more life experience and that means a lot, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it really comes down to like, do people want to hang out with you, you know, as far as getting a job? So I really think that, you know, you got to have the work, but if you have the work and you're cool to hang out with, people don't really care about your age. You know, we, at Gnome and have uh, a lot of teachers and a lot of staff and, and the age range is all over the place. You know, we mm -hmm. have people on staff that are in their sixties um, and they're awesome. Yeah, I agree. There's not really a specific time or age. I've seen a lot of, um, there was an artist that I, I went to Gnome with who ended up, I think he was transitioning out of banking. Uh, his name is Masa. Mm -hmm. uh, and he ended up, you know, he was a Japanese artist who came over. I think he did the Maya Fast Track program and then did a couple uh, other you know, side courses at the time. And, you know, I think he was transitioning out of the financial sector and just wanted to change up and get be more creative. And then, you know, now he's a lead artist at ILM and, you know, he must be in his 50s at this point, I would imagine. Right. So just people transitioning careers. Like I've seen a lot of people do that and be, be very successful with it. I wonder what that person, uh, what Terry means by the uh, 40 to 80 thing. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Question, it looks like, uh, how many uh, softwares? You have a question. You, uh, you use many softwares, but sometimes you get a fuzzy brain with software because there's too many different things to learn. Yeah, how do you keep it straight? Um, that's I don't use as many softwares, Alex. You use a lot more softwares than I do. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you keep that all in your brain? Um, just learn what you need to get the task at hand done. I would say, you know, so like if you have something you're working on and you need some, you know, like if I'm like I need to grow some ivy on this rock, then I'm going to focus on learning just what I need to know about speed treat to grow Ivy on that rock. You know, I'm not going to worry about all the buttons and options and menus that are in there that don't have to do with that. Because I think a lot of people that get new or, or get introduced to new software feel like you're supposed to know a lot more about it than you are. You know, like mm -hmm. there's so much about Maya. I don't know. There's so much about Photoshop. I don't know, or, uh, you know, world machine or any, program that I use, you just, you know, so it's like, if I go into Maya and I just like go into animation and look around, it's like, you know, they added mash. I didn't touch it for a while until I finally did and learned mash. And I was like, Oh, mash is awesome. But that doesn't mean that if I go into the effects category that like, I haven't used N cloth, I haven't used N hair, mm -hmm. I haven't used N any of the N stuff. So I don't know what any of this stuff does. I mean, I know what it's supposed to do, but I don't know how to use it. That's fine because I'm not an effects artist, right? So I think, like just accepting that you don't have to know everything, you know, these and just learn the basics of what you need. So that's where I think like learning software for software's sake is dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm gonna like learn Maya just to learn it. 
then it's like, well, you could be learning that for the rest of your life then because they're going to keep changing it and keep adding it, like make something. So if you have like a piece of concept art that you're going to make, just focus on learning what you need to learn to make that thing, you know? And I think that makes it a little less intimidating. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think I'm going to replace this character with uh, something else. Oh, there you go. So just because uh, that sounds like a fun thing to do. But nice. I do like how he's in the scene and his posture. So I think I might take that model into mm -hmm. ZBrush and just use that as a start point. Cool. And then you can have the same scale and everything, or at least. Yeah. So I'm going to make, let's see which character that's that dude. Do you do either of you keep note journals? I have a lot of journals. I don't know if they're specifically like for notes, but I have a lot of notes on my phone as well. I use OneDrive and I use like uh, the notes app and I use Google Drive and just kind of create like a bank of things that I keep for myself. So in that way, yeah. Um, I do have, you know, sketchbooks all over. So I have a bunch, like I have one right here. I have another one over there and pens everywhere. So if I have like an idea, I'll definitely write that down right away. I have never been a journal person. No? Mm -mm. I find I've definitely really had friends who were, and I think it's awesome. Like, you know, I'm jealous of people who have journals going back years where you can like get back into your headspace from mm. long ago. I think it's cool. But yeah, I never, never did the journal thing. Notes for sure. I mean, like I always have a billion, you know, text files on the desktop with notes and to do lists and thoughts and things that I need to work on. And um, so I think, uh, but the thing with that is like, they disappear. It's not like a journal. Like if I was writing in a journal all the time, my notes and to do lists, then that would be archived, but I kind of do it like with text files. So yeah. All right. I've got this guy. He is rotated. So I'm going to zero that out. So I'm going to freeze them and export this model so I can bring it over to ZBrush. Do you still watch tutorials from time to time? I do. I think you do totally. too. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, because software keeps changing, new features yeah, come to. out. So I think uh, that's super important. You know, it's like Maddie's new uh, intro to ZBrush title for the workshop for like ZBrush 2020 is like, I don't know, it's like 50 hours long, but it's like a million <laughs> chapters. So if I want to learn a specific new feature in ZBrush, you know, then I'll just jump to the chapter that she recorded for that. That's awesome. Does making a 3D work from someone else's painting considered as stealing art? No, uh, if, especially if you credit them, right? If you're saying like, you know, I'm using this concept and I'm turning it into 3D and you say this is, you know, who the artist was and maybe send a link or whatever, that is, that is definitely not considered stealing artwork. Oh, here's a good throwback question. Mm -hmm. Is new tech light wave still a thing in the industry? You remember it using it in the nineties on my Intel P 75, 16 megabyte Ram and one megabyte S three trio graphic graphics nice. card. Yeah. Makes me think of Babylon five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, light wave was like big in like the TV space back in the nineties for sure. But, uh, but then if I remember correctly, didn't like a bunch of the development team leave and they started, uh, I think like Moto. Moto. Yeah. So I don't think anymore, but Moto was for a while, for a hot minute. It still gets used, but it it was pretty popular for a while in like uh, like five, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. A lot of people I hear oh, moved to Blender Dick recently. Dick Van Dyke. What? Yeah. <laughs> That is of everybody you could have listed like on the globe, the not even in the top hundred thousand. Like, yeah. Like you used to see them like at the new tech booth at Sigra. <laughs> That's so funny. That's amazing. 
I know. That's really funny. You getting your guy in there? Yeah. I am uh, progressing on this sketch, so I've, I'm not going to likely work on these legs, but I'm trying to work on how these pieces are going to intersect and maybe what this face will eventually be. I think it's just a sketch of a face, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. I like this idea of it being like sort of uh, magic. And so magic and like science combined. So if you could do that, you could do different types of ways to connect a uh, like an Android. Play around with that more. There he is, Inzy Brush. Yeah. Now to figure out what I'm going to do with this guy. Grab my tablet. Can we do something like like pack everything into one file? which in Blender is textures, mesh, lights, et cetera, in Maya. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're talking about something like an FBX. Just going to have, have, I think, everything. Well, and it can also go cross-platform. It's pretty cool. And they've gotten better too. They didn't used to be as reliable, but now I've I've seen that FBXs are pretty reliable going even between like, you know, Maya and Max or I think you can even export an FBX out of ZBrush now. Is that true? Oh I just Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can go to export and export a instead of an OBJ, which is standard, you can export FBX. Opinions on Unreal MetaHumans. We talked about that last stream and probably the stream before. It seems to be a very common topic. Uh, to me, I think it's really cool. I think it's just going to make it easier for smaller you know, creators or companies to um, do bigger stuff. They're pretty cool. I don't think it's going to be, you know, with a lot of questions we get about MetaHumans is like job. Is it going to remove jobs? Is it going to do anything like that? I don't. I don't foresee that happening. I think it'll just allow people to artists to focus on the more important parts of characters or things like that. Memes, probably for backgrounds for films and stuff. Creating this like shoulder joint. I got to figure out how it will probably rotate around, but I think we're getting to an okay space. Uh, I ended up, one of the things that I do quite a bit in ZBrush is I will actually take two pieces of geometry. So this is the same piece of geometry as this piece of geometry. So this one and this one. And I just deflate it and I put it inside it and then I start sculpting through it so that they're, I can kind of create these shapes, um, just kind of goes straight through the mesh like this. And I find that really useful for doing even something like this. Like, you know, pull out a thing. You know, that can be a, a shape that I can now sculpt on and design. But um, also use it for color coordination, too. So that's what this is right now. Hopeful. Are you just going to start sculpting on the scan, or are you going to, what's your, what are you thinking? Uh, I think I'm going to just replace his head. Let's start with that. There we go. Get that out of the way. <laughs> just Let's remove see. it and start sculpting something new? Uh, yeah. Would you guys consider learning Unreal Engine on live stream? That would be a lot of fun. Uh, I've actually debated that, learning a piece of software or something on stream. I think that could be interesting. Um, I don't know. 
I think it could be interesting. I, I definitely want to Unreal is one of the things that I want to learn, like probably as like my next rendering engine, right? That's what I would want my next pieces of projects or whatever to be rendered and textured and displayed in. So that could be part of that, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think I want to learn Unreal. Yeah. But I'm not sure how I want to approach it as far as like how to learn it. Mm -mm. I mean, it looks awesome for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, especially with Unreal 5, you know, looming at some point, all mm -hmm. the cool stuff they showed in those, the demos and definitely worth taking a look at, absolutely. How often do you spend time on sculpting, like automating processes and plugin? Oh, sorry, and scripting. I misread. How often do you spend time on scripting, like automating processes and plugins, or do you get a tech artist or software engineer to do it for you? Uh, in stuff that we're doing like today, none probably. Um, but I think in big projects, like if you're in a production, uh, this. The tools or the, the you know, engineers or tech artists will definitely be there to help you. Um, and that's kind of their their job, kind of their role in the pipeline. So uh, most of the time you'll see the artists don't spend that much time scripting. It'd be rare to see one who does a lot. I agree. I am not a fan. I've never, never been a big coder i tried i tried to learn some coding and some stuff like that but it just didn't really fit with me like i was never really comfortable with it yeah the first uh, 3d computer graphics class that i took was a programming class hmm. um because back in the 90s i was going to uh, like a regular liberal arts college Mm -hmm. And uh, Jurassic Park had come out, and Terminator Two, and I was like super curious about like how to learn about 3D. And I noticed that there was a uh, 3D computer graphics course at the university. It was a very large university, like 10,000 students kind of place. And uh, but it was in the computer science department, and so I you know, I took a intro to C++ class, and so I could, which was a prereq. And once I showed up to that class, I mean, it was just so over my head. I was like, you know what? I think I just want to learn the software that other people are making. I don't think I want to be a developer. Mm -hmm. And that's when I dropped out of that school and started looking for an art school. <laughs> You're like, and I'm not going here. Um. I got a question from Twitch. This is an interesting one. Um, should I lean towards a certain industry when looking for entry level job, or is it more like grab whatever is available? Um, I don't. To be frank, I don't know if you're going to be able to get a job by just grabbing whatever is available. Like, I feel like you should have a, a more defined goal, especially if you're coming from like the CG. And I, I don't know anything about your portfolio or anything like that. But if you're coming from something you know in the CG realm, a lot of the like you might need to devote more time versus grab whatever is available. I don't know where you live or anything like that, but it'd be difficult. I would personally focus your portfolio a little more heavily and uh, aim for a specific type of job. There it is, Red Hood Man. Now we'll see what he ends up looking like. I'm just shocked you use that material. That's like my least favorite material. Uh, you know, it's because I'm on uh, a different computer today, so. Uh. I don't think I have any. I don't have any other options. I do. Have like the basic ones, but I do. Which one do you use? What's your favorite? 
Uh, if I if I'm on a new computer, I use the Mac Cap Gray, which is this the basic one. Yeah, I just I just don't like that wax one for some reason. It really bothers me. You use this one, Matt Cap Gray. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, you know, I it's funny. I I actually don't mind the red one. <laughs> it's odd. I like some people. I've seen a lot of people use it, and they're like, you know, don't have issues with it. But for me, it's like it's it's the one that I'm like, I just don't like the way that most sculpts look in it. Feels um, it is a waxy material, but it just has like an odd odd feel to me. Maybe it's because it has like that faceting at like lower resolutions. It gets that like sort of line in between the polygons. I like to work with low polygons, so maybe that's why it's more. Okay, I'm gonna go back to it right now. Just complaining. <laughs> Misha, hello, Misha. I see you on YouTube. Misha's a Nomen student. It says red wax is sacrilegious. So as you're starting a character, what are you what are you looking for? Uh, right now, nothing. Uh, to me, this is like just doodling. So I'm mm -hmm. just uh, since I don't have a sketch or thumbnail, you know, which I usually would like to start with, <clears throat> then this is the equivalent of the sketching thumbnailing thing on paper. I'm just mm -hmm. doodling to see what I find. So I actually. Couldn't tell you where this is going to end up. <laughs> so you're just kind of looking for shapes you like. Yeah, but that's what I love about ZBrush in the end. But, you know, I think I'm, to be honest, very rusty on the ZBrush thing. So you got to forgive me. I've been doing so much environment stuff for so long hmm. that uh, I'm just going to have to accept that this is going to go through its ugly phase. They all do. Every sculpt does. Everything goes through an ugly phase. Yeah. Shape hunting. That's what somebody just yeah. commented. Totally. Um, Alpha Matt from YouTube is asking me a question. Did I cut UVs and retopo characters in my High Priestess project? Uh, that was my Art Station Masterclass from several years ago. And also now a Nomen uh, workshop. To DVD tutorial. Um, what specifically are you asking about it? Like, did I? I don't think I did. I think I rendered everything in that in in Keyshot. So, I, if I did UVs, I was very likely just planar projecting them. Um, and the retop part of it, I think I only retop sections of it in that one. Only the pieces that I wanted to be, you know, a little bit more. Um, resolved than the other ones, I think. Just a little bit here and there. Yeah, that was a fun project. I haven't, I haven't done a, a workshop in a long time. I guess we went to Australia together. I did them there, but it was also a while ago. no problem um alex somebody is interested in environments where can they find your work and some tutorials maybe well i think you can find the tutorials on the nomen workshop mm -hmm. um my work alexalvarez.com and so i've got uh let's see da, 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 da. Mm -mm. So 
So yeah, this is my website that I have up. <clears throat> um, and so in here, there's different stuff. And so for, you know, environment stuff, which is all Maya, like this is Maya world machine rendered with Redshift. Um, the ship is a uh, ZBrush that I then finished in Maya. So like I sculpted the shape of the ship in ZBrush and then just retopped it and, and modeled it out in Maya. Um, and then a bunch of uh, kit bashed parts from kit bash 3D. Um, I did a thing for their Twitch Bob Ross thing like a couple years ago. And so they gave me access to some of their kits, which was really fun. So that's kind of what I made this platform out of is they have a kit called Greebles. And then uh, I did that for that as well. Uh, so this is uh, same thing, world machine terrains, and then the uh, sort of more of the Kit Bash 3D stuff for the buildings in the background, and then a lot of MASH for instancing. And then we've got just a lot of random. You can see I've done this thing before where I just grab a scan and then replace the head. So that's what that's going on. Uh, so yeah, these are just alexalvarez.com. There's random stuff in here, all personal work. So mostly what I do is personal stuff and then random renders of random things. Photography, like I was talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of that as well. So Death Valley, which is like five hours from here, which is amazingly cool looking. Yeah. It's like Death Valley is just nuts. So yeah, if you want to be an environment artist, for sure, it's like getting your car and drive. Mm -hmm. You know? Because there's something about being in these places and taking, doing, you know, getting into photography and then like processing your photos. It just causes you to like stare at environments for hours because you're hiking and you're walking and you're or traveling or road tripping and taking pictures, going through them. It's like all of that time spent and figuring out what it is that you like about the photos that you took, whether it's the lighting or the atmospheric effects or like, you know, you pretend that these are renders. You know, it's like I'll look at photos. And just be like, if this was a render, like, how would I do this? And like, that gets my brain working. But the nice thing about doing it off of your own photography is that it's it's your eye that took the picture and did the composition based on your taste and the way you processed it. Um, so it's very personal. Um, and uh, and learning how to process pictures. And like, these are mostly HDRs. So like, you know, shooting multiple pictures that are bracketed together and put into an HDR. So you have a, you know, 32 bit high dynamic range image. So you learn about that workflow and processing that, but through photography as opposed to 3D renders. And uh, and then looking at a lot of these images and saying like, you know, how much the sky plays in what might be a cool composition for an environment. Um, because there's some pretty cool cloud patterns in a lot of these. So it's like looking at this, it's like, you know, zebra sculpt the terrain and then mash to make all of the vegetation and speed tree to block out, you know, some of these bushes, but most of those bushes look like they're the same, you know, species. Um, there's a creosote bush that's big in Southern California that's kind of everywhere, which is what most of this is. So. And it gives you like a good place to begin your reference and kind of get to know more about it and good place to critique and it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I just looking at these pictures, this is from like the road trip to death Valley, like four years ago. So, mm -hmm. and for, for people who don't know death Valley, it's the hottest place on earth. So I think it's gets up to like 130 degrees in the summer, which is brutal. But if you go there this time of year, it's pretty nice. That's good. Yeah, because it's actually very cold in the winter and then very, very hot in the summer. And there's a lot of like, you know, abandoned mines out there. Mm -hmm. There's just so many cool rock formations. 
And look at that lighting. That's awesome. You know, it's like, because you've got, you know, red rock and a blue sky. So red and blue make purple. So you get like, you know, so this is just lots of cool ideas come from photography. But anyway, that's the, uh, and then yeah, tutorials. Um, I've got a bunch of tutorials at the workshop. So some of them might have been made a while ago, but the the techniques are all still the same. You know, so what I need to update is the rendering engine on these. But uh, so I'm I'm definitely past due on making new tutorials for sure. And I'm gonna go back to ZBrush. How's your model coming? Going okay. I'm just kind of exploring some more shapes. So I just kind of up this, and I was playing around with this area here. Kind of, uh, slowly pushing it up from like, you know, where it was like this. So I had it kind of at this lower res state to get the primary form. And then now, thank you for saving, uh, up resing it and getting a little bit more information in here as to like what that shape could be made of. So kind of just blocking in and you know, kind of same in the front, like this is what the shape was. So I'm thinking that this is like a little area that there'd be something in here. Whatever this thing would be. So this like thing that's going to like emitting I wanted to play around with the idea of you know like this magical some other or elemental thing like some sort of like a connection between like the, the elements that wouldn't necessarily be just wires and traditional you know me me mechanics mechanisms make it function so trying to think of ways that that, that could be fun and that could change a little bit so getting in there that's cool there's something about the it. shape reminds me of one of the characters from ai yeah i think it's this part like this part being like this front mask where because there's a girl there's a shot of like the girl who like you know, yeah, yeah 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 she's like doo, 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 and then she like turns and like this yep. is all that so i kind of like that as like the understructure i think that eventually you know just like to do it very very quickly i would probably have something that would be like covering that looks like hair but this would be more like oh some some there'll be costume i guess is what i'm saying there'll be something that covers all this up but it could create like a cool um, glow inside of there if there's these elements. So I'm kind of just trying to think of like inside out, build it up, be a fun way or different way to, to do a Android. And I haven't, I haven't done at least in a while. All the ones I've done are very mechanical or very precise and so I kind of want to try something that's maybe more like exploring the idea of making this like handmade arcane I guess rather than um, get kind of a mix of those things cool you guys start learning ZBrush knowing how to draw or is it necessary to be a good drawer to be good at ZBrush I do not think you need to be able to draw to use ZBrush. I think there's a lot of sculptors out there that uh, don't really like drawing, and that's why they're into sculpture. They're very different things because drawing, you need to think about you know shading and perspective, and you don't with sculpture. Mm -hmm. And that's a big hang-up that a lot of people have with getting better at drawing as they struggle with that. And the nice thing with ZBrush or sculpting is you just don't need to worry about shading. You don't need to worry about perspective. So, but you do at the same time need to be passionate about, you know, the observation skills necessary to learn about 
form or anatomy or all those kinds of things. And so, which is something often the people who like to draw study, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're into comic books or fantasy art, you know, there's a, all that stuff is going to be inspired by reference. So, but you can totally become an artist focusing on sculpture and skip drawing. Um, I think that's, uh, there's definitely a lot of people out there that are sculptors that and very little that. time. I don't spend much time drawing. I never really did. I, it's actually a point of weakness now where I want to focus on it, but it gets very frustrating because I know I could make in sculpture much faster. <laughs> like I have a way of creating what I want, but I, I uh, wish that I had drawn more, but I don't, I don't spend much time doing it. Something I want to focus on at some point. But you need to be able to sculpt, and that's just as hard. So, yep, I mean, it's it's definitely still going to require a lot of practice, but it's all time, you know? It's like if you spend time drawing or spend time sculpting and do it all the time, you're going to get better. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to worry about where you are today you just have to think about where you want to be and just keep plugging away and as long as you feel like you learned something today you learned something this week that you're better today than you were a month ago you know as long as you can see some sort of progress as time goes by you'll eventually get to a point that your work will make you employable if that's your goal and how many you know Days, weeks, months, years will that be? I mean, it is what it is. I think that, you know, it just, uh, it comes with the passion to just want to make art because that's what you love doing. But it is a time consuming thing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. What number is the stopping point when following artists on Instagram? I don't think there really is one. I think it's just, you know, the balance of, of looking at reference, it sounds like, you know, how do you, you're asking, how do you manage time with art consumption? Um, for me, it's downtime. Like when I'm not doing anything else, I might come in and, and look at that, look at Instagram or ArtStation or things like that for inspiration and just like see what's out there and, passionate about it it's, sometimes it's hard to avoid if you like it I don't like this piece make it a little more streamlined Any portfolio reviews incoming? Uh, not on this stream, not right away, no. Talked about it, but some of it's the logistics and just figuring out how we would do it and, you know. Not, not currently, not, not planned. mixing these meshes around i'm um you know kind of like pushing them in and out of each other and just kind of playing around with it let us know if there's any questions in the chat happy to answer them happy to talk to them alex it looks like you're kind of exploring some little horns and kind of getting a little further i'm just trying to figure out the uh... Where Shape. this guy's gonna end up, but still in the ugly phase for sure. Yeah, I'll go through that. But I think that's that's one of the, there's a lot of questions that people have about like I think your silhouette's working though. You know, people because he's tiny, me, so you know he's gonna be small. Yeah, 
a, a perseverance, perseverance and pushing through a project when it is in that ugly state can be, re- can be really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's knowing that, you know, eventually you'll get through it and it'll, it'll look better. One of us might be bringing, breathing into our mic. I don't know if that's you or me, but just to know. Thank you, Goosebumps. I'm going to not breathe now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's where we need music. We're trying to figure out our music thing, but the music only works if one of us uh, is sharing our screen. Figure that out at some point. Or we both hear each other's music, which we played with last last night and was not not super successful. All right, I'm gonna switch my Mac cap. Sometimes I just switch my Mac caps to um, just get like a different read on it. And I also, uh, while I'm streaming, actually, I like to switch it into, uh, I like to look at the stream preview as like a smaller, like the navigator in Photoshop. I use that quite a bit to just explore other uh, looks of something. Sometimes not, they're not always helpful, but. Let's see this red one. So I don't really know what my characters would be made out of. It'll help me quite a bit to understand the shapes. So I'll have to figure that out at some point. Materials. Alex, I think it might be your microphone. Huh. Let's see if I can. It does have automatic adjust. I'm going to turn that off. So I'm going to play around with your mic setting. Let's see if it's just getting picked up. that work on this face for a little bit I always get like um, hesitant to start on the head for some reason sometimes I start on the face but then sometimes I get like worried to move forward on it like I don't know exactly where this is gonna go One of the things I was talking about earlier, I think right when you were you were joining, I was going to start talking about Blade Runner. Obviously, you're a big Blade Runner fan. Something I think that's obviously super interesting about Blade Runner is I'm doing an Android, which is why I was talking about that. Is um, th- you know how they realized that the replicants were incredibly dangerous and powerful, and so they gave them a lifespan. Mm-hmm. So. If you were to make an Android, I'm kind of trying to like put myself in that brain space of like, if you're going to make something, are you going to allow it to potentially, you know, like have a lifespan, like a, you know, a, a shutdown, like how do you kind of build some of that into this thing in the way that, uh, different because i like that idea it's a cool it's, you know it's obviously a, it's essentially what the film is built on a, they need to be chased down some of them don't have them kind of in the second one 
interesting concept. What did you think of the uh, sequel? 2049? Mm -hmm. Not as good as the first one. I don't think it was as good. I thought the the cinematography was beautiful. Yes, it was Music visually was great. I thought beautiful. But I don't feel like it quite captured the... I don't know, it just didn't, didn't capture what I wanted. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's just something there that it didn't get. This is just so human. I don't know if I like this. True, we do. We also have a lifespan too, but it, I think the fact is theirs is like part of their design. I, know, I guess they could just be normal eyes, but they could also be like a thing. If I want it to be humanoid, I said I wanted it to be humanoid. But I don't know. I don't I don't know where I'm going with this one. The no nose style. Yeah. The classic classic alien robot look. What kind of camera do you favor in your photo taking, Alex? Um, I've been Canon for a really long time, so. Um, but I just got a Sony, uh, which is um, the Sony A7C, which is what I'm uh, using right now on the stream. And Sony is our have become really, really impressive. So yeah, you're you were showing off some of the cool features of your uh, the, the camera you're using now, which is the Sony, and it's pretty awesome. Just how quickly it adapts, the focus, the autofocus, the uh, just immediately looking for video. Great. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, because my Canon isn't video; mm -hmm. it's a little bit older. Question for Alex. Is Mari dead? No. People are still using Mari. Uh, I think that if you need to, you know, texture a hero asset for film that's going to have, you know, 30 UV regions where each UV region has uh, 8K maps where there is, you know, color displacement, bump, spec normal for you know each one of those you know uv regions or udims then for super super heavy high res texturing for film i think marty's workflow is still very much used in the industry but i think it's overkill for you know lower res stuff or games i think substance painter has clearly become super super popular mm -hmm. I think it just depends on what the result is. Like somebody's saying it's it's good for like a main character for hero characters. Uh, when we were using it quite a bit, it was uh, we used it a lot more in photo projection, uh, where a substance right. painter wasn't wasn't being as used at least at that time, a few years ago. But being used in photo projection, whereas Mari. Definitely isn't like you're saying, especially with multiple UDIMs. I think that's one of the big areas that it's uh, really, really good. 
Yeah. So I'd say, you know, but for, you know, for personal work, like for people that are working on a, a reel to be a texture artist, you don't necessarily want to take an asset and texture it so that the camera can zoom up to a toenail, you know, as zoom up to any square inch of the body of the character and have it hold up because that takes forever. You could be, you know, texturing something for a month, which if it's for a movie, then you have to because that's it's maybe this asset's going to be in several shots you know think of a creature in like a movie like you know kong versus godzilla like you know mm -hmm. the, the texture space of godzilla must be insane like there could be you know uh you know because that's appearing in lots of shots in the film where in one shot it could be the hand and one shot it could be the foot a claw a toe yeah. the eye region so super super uh high fidelity but that's very very time consuming yeah it's very different it's also a very different need right i think that's also why you see like substance uh being very popular in the gaming circle because you're not doing those types of characters or shots as often. The full screen character that's going to be, you know, massive in scale is somewhat uncommon. There are some, but even then, you know, you're still limited in the texture space and size and stuff that you can really do. Only problem with substance is you can't use displacement maps from XYZ as you do in Mari. Yeah, exactly. Both great, though. I think that they're all, you know, to me, I think things like Substance Painter and Designer uh, kind of are getting into that more artist-friendly, user-friendly space. Mari is not, not user-friendly, but it's, you know, when you start seeing things like Mixer appear and, you know, all that, that stuff, it's just kind of uh, easier to use for and to comprehend for somebody who's never used it before. I think that's part of the why you see substance being very popular. So there. Substance is owned by Adobe now. Who owns mm -hmm. Substance? Yeah. Adobe. Who owns Mari? It's just... avoided the 3D space for so long. So it would be interesting yeah. to see what happens. Coming along. Slowly. I completely erased the face I was working on, so Oh really? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, ah, I don't I don't like it where this is going. So I'm starting over trying to be more gestural from the beginning rather than just like jumping into a a normal face. So I'm like just that torso looks neat though. This is getting there. Like this has some some elements in it that are kind of cool. So I'm like, this just the, the face will all do it. But it was like, this just, you see all that? It just feels like a, like you said, that AI thing. It's like, I don't know if it's really the direction I want to go. So now I'm here starting over, trying something different. To do it maybe more like broad strokes gestural from the very beginning and see if I can get that to tie in. 
And the faces are always the hardest for me, though. Like they, if I start with, like, I like sometimes starting with the body, which I said earlier, but then mm -hmm. if I do that, making a face that now fits the body takes a lot longer. I can make a, a head, but it's not necessarily going to, like, gel with the style I've already done. It takes me a lot longer to do that. Yeah, I I always start with the head. I find it same thing. Like it's it's weird to add a head to a body and then have it feel cohesive. Yeah, texture on there. Got a question from Twitch. It sounds like you're uh, trying to create a normal human character. You've restarted uh, a couple YouTube tutorials on Blender, and you're struggling because it's just not looking good. Um, should you use some other tutorials, or should you restart it and try again? Um, that's a tough question. I mean, it, it sounds like you're getting into 3D in general, and so you know you're at the beginning phase where you're, you're probably fighting a couple angles. Some of it is likely the software, and some of it is just the artistic side of working in 3D. And so every time you restart that tutorial, you're probably going to get a little better at one of those, maybe both. Um, so, so that, uh, I think you just got to keep pushing through regardless of what it is you're going to. Like if you're going to, to do, you want to try another tutorial? Sure, try another tutorial. There's no reason that that will hurt you. Um, but at some point, you know, we were talking about this earlier, but every project you're going to work on is going to go through this, you know, this very ugly phase, this unpretty phase where you're not, you're not liking the way that it's going. Um, you kind of just have to push through that and just accept that knowing that it's, knowing that it will get better if you keep pushing through. And sometimes that is going through it multiple times, you know. So uh, it does not really an answer for you, but I would just keep, keep keep trying regardless of whether it's that tutorial or another tutorial. Yeah, persistence uh, is really important. What we're using today is ZBrush. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you can look at any of the projects that anybody's ever worked on. I have several that I could pull open and show, but you know, there's phases where it doesn't look good, and it's like it's just not, it's just not there. We'll eventually get there if I keep working at it. But you know, it, all right, coffee number one finished. Coffee number two. I'm not happy with the one I'm making now. <laughs> oh, you have two. You had them lined up. Nice. Okay. I think part of what my problem is is I haven't really been thinking about how this thing is going to speak. Or how it would emote? Would it emote? Just scanning comments. Okay, normal human character, no comic style or fantasy. Restart. That's the one you just read. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Oh, yeah. One thing I oh, think that's okay. really important for people to do is just like exercises that are could be considered really tedious. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was in art school, it was like, you know, like master copies. You know, um, master copies are at the time didn't seem like fun because you want to be creative and you want to use your imagination and you want to do stuff from your head. Like, and so I was really annoyed that we didn't get to do much of that. But the thing is, is that mm -hmm. it's important to, to study not just anatomy, but then what it is about characters or creatures or whatever that you think is cool. So like with characters, it could be costume you know, that makes characters cool. Yeah. And so now you want to sort of study clothing um, with creatures. What is it about creatures that you like that could be, you know, well, animals, you know, like most creature designers are referencing nature. So sitting and doing drawings or sculpts mm -hmm. of a dog, a horse, an octopus, a squid, like can seem tedious but you're going to learn a lot doing that kind of stuff. And those shapes are going to get stuck in your head. So I think that's something for people that are new, trying to figure out what to do. It's like, just do studies. And I see a lot of professionals doing that, you know, like yeah, Crystal say you, she does beautiful studies of animals and there's so much to learn from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, got a question here from YouTube. Uh, it's for both of us. They have been dealing with perfectionism and procrastination in their art. What advice do you have to fight those negative attributes? Perspective, nomen student as well. Good vibes. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's two angles there. One is perfectionism and one is procrastination. I think there's a good chance they may be playing together at the same time. Uh, um, well, procrastination is, I think, perfectionism. Where, uh, that's, yeah. Procrastination, I think it's good to have friends that are into the same thing so that you do it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That definitely helps. Yeah, well, meaning like, like having a coach, you know, like if you have a coach, the coach is going to, or a drill sergeant or a trainer or whatever, like if your friends can be that, you know, if you have friends that are always sitting on the couch playing video games, then they're going to suck you into that, you know, but mm -hmm. if you have friends that are super motivated and super busy, that's going to rub off on you. So I think who you surround yourself with makes a really, really, really big difference on your ability, not just to not procrastinate, but also to have constant access to crits and advice and, you know, the enthusiasm of learning together and you discover something cool and share that with your friends and they discover something cool about art and they share that with you. I don't think that can be like understated how important it is to have friends that are into the same thing that you are. Mm -hmm. Seems like my audio might be having problems. My internet might be shutting down again, which would be fun. Uh, but the second part of that is perfectionism. And I think it goes into the same thing, which is if you're in this state of always learning or, or wanting to learn, uh, accepting that you're always, you know, you'll never create the perfect piece ever. And the next one is, is you know, you're going to learn from every piece you do. And so at a certain point, you just have to be okay being done. And knowing that that's as good as that piece is going to be, and the next one, you know, you'll you'll make the next one better. And so, if you can kind of get into that mindset of, you know, I'm always learning, I'm always wanting to be better, I'm always I'm going to make the next one better, I'm going to learn from myself, I'm going to give myself critique, I'm going to get critique from my friends. Like Alex was saying, like it can kind of go together, where you're. Uh, continuously trying to get better because you'll never you'll never make anything perfect there will always be some small issue with it right that's okay though that's very normal
starting. But yeah, perfectionism, I'm, you know, I think it's like, it's more of like you just wanting your work to be better than it is. Is that, you think what that means? Mm -hmm. It could be too, yeah. I mean, I've kind of talked about this before on stream, but different types of, uh, sometimes for me, like an issue that I have, that I had very early when I was sculpting was always trying to make every phase of the, of the project be perfect. Right. So like, um, you know, if I'm sculpting a head, I'm always, I would always, you know, and I was actually doing this at Noman, and one of the Noman teachers kind of gave me some advice on to not do that or, or ways to not do that. Um, and I would always be smoothing. Like I would sculpt, I would sculpt, I would sculpt, and I would smooth every part of it so that it was always looking presentable, always looking good. And that was kind of stopping me from never getting to a point where I was really exploring Right. And I wasn't able to push past a certain level because I was constantly stopping myself and making sure it was presentable or, or just that the geometry was clean or whatever. And it wasn't, I wasn't able to create and explore. And so maybe, maybe that could be an area of the perfectionism as well, where it's what you're working on, allowing it, allowing yourself to not be perfect at every step of the way at every stage. And, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times already today, but like, having you be okay with it there being an ugly phase that there is an ugly phase and everything's going to go through an ugly phase and um you know that's that's just part of creating i mean i, th I think it's like you know something we see a lot at noman which is interesting is that you know it's a there's the two year and the three year. So either you have eight terms or you have 12. And most grads would say that, you know, each term the work gets better so that, you know, mm -hmm. people might, you know, get really worked up over something they're doing in term one. But what you have to remember is like, there is no way that by the time you get to term 12, you're going to want to put what something you did in term one in your portfolio or in your reel. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, it, it has no meaning other than just being exercise and practice, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mean anything. It's not going to be in your reel. So don't worry about it. Just work on it and make it as good as you can. That term will end. Everything you worked on in that term will be done, will be over. It is as good as it could be at that time. And then term two starts. Mm -hmm. And at the end of term two, you're going to notice that your work is better than what you did in term one. And that happens every three months. And so that, you know, you're, as long as you're spending all of your waking hours trying to just produce the work you're required to produce for homework, um, you're over time going to get better. And that's uh, something that just we see over and over and over again. Um, but you know, if you're in term one, looking at the work that students are in term 12 doing and being like, I wish my work looked that way, it will, you just have to put in the time and not beat yourself up, up over being term one and not having term 12 work. And right. so even if you're not at Gnome and you're just an individual trying to get better work on your portfolio, it's the same thing. Like, you know, uh, you definitely don't want to think that you're not capable of it. Like, you know, oh, I'm never going to be good. It's like, that's not true. Like, because some people beat themselves up thinking that there's some kind of gene that they don't have. And there is no such thing as an art gene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, just part of the learning process. I think it's part of it. You're always, you're always getting better, and you're always evaluating, and you're always 
pushing through and going to the next step. And, you know, I, but that's part of the reason, you know, I, um, one of the things I love about ZBrush as a program is that you can load up your old files and they'll be in the same space and the same location and everything. And so you can always go back and, and look at what your progress was on that specific file. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, uh, I'll just show you what, this is just from today. Like today, this is what I started on. Right. And this is fine. Like this is a decent starting point, but it's not like anything I love. And if I, you know, can get really frustrated with this, but then, you know, now I'm starting to make some, some progress on another piece. Like I can see it starting to come together and eventually I'm going to get to a point where I think it's going to, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and it's just pushing through all that, that stuff and not worrying about it being perfect at every step, not worrying about about that I think is a really big um, part of it. I mean, I could pull open a ton of files that even I've done on this stream that are going to have, you know, the beginning of them is going to be rough. Like it's not going to look great, right? But eventually it, it ends up looking okay. Uh, like here's one that we started on. It was more of a final one. Let's find something I... I did a while ago. This is what I did last stream. It's really cool. This is my, this is when I was like, I'm going to make this. It was from somebody from the stream. It was like, this is my dragon. And this is my first, you know, I'm getting all the pieces in to make my dragon. This is a, a not a good model. Like this is not, this is all the pieces there, but it's not there. Right? And over, t you know, if I get frustrated or, you know, try to make each element of this better, uh, and try to make it perfect i will never progress i need to allow myself to to push it uh and, and accept that it's not perfect and so eventually again this isn't like a amazing model but the progress goes from there to there in in a couple hours and that's because i eventually you know put in just pushed through the awkward parts of it so going from our, your base mesh or starting point to getting to something later is just the perseverance of knowing that a, a parts of the, the process, it's going to suck. It's going to not look great. Like you can see like the progress now, like from here to here to here, or even like this one from here to there, this was the next step. So I knew that I didn't like this and I wanted to push it into this, right? Continuously pushing it over and over and over. Actually, this is the next one. So, from here to here, you can see me taking and adjusting and critiquing from here to here to getting to a final, quote unquote, final in a couple of hours a piece. So just kind of continuously working through and not, not worrying about how perfect it is. That's really not an important part of it. Uh, somebody was asking a good question, which was about, do you create, or they say, do we, do we create art? for artist or for consumption are you making it it sounds like are you making it for yourself or are you making it for others i guess is the question i don't i think that's more personal depending on what that's you like personal, to do or yeah. what your job is yeah, yeah. for I me i make it for myself yeah some some people do it purely for themselves and have no interest in social media and no interest in posting and no interest in any of that stuff. They just do it for themselves and that's it. Some people love feedback. Some people post stuff, but also love to engage with others and share their work and see what people think. And um, so I think it's, I think it's specific. Yeah. To you. No, but uh think it can be you know a little uh, nerve-wracking the whole like posting for social media and waiting to hear what people have to think about it if they're strangers mm -hmm. you know I think I prefer to hear what friends think about stuff than strangers mm -hmm. somebody's asking why we don't use Cintiqs you have a Cintiq at your uh Home. I do. Yeah, yeah. So not here, though. But uh, I like both. Do you use them for different things? 
how about what's um, the same I if I'm going to do something 2D, like you know, draw in Photoshop, I I prefer the Cintiq for sure. Mm -hmm. But for ZBrush, I don't think I prefer one over the other. Mm -hmm. What about you? Have you used Cintiq much? I've used them a couple of times. Uh, the thing I don't like about the Cintiq is actually it's not the posture. Somebody was asking about the posture part of it. Um, is I don't like the texture of the Cintiqs because they sometimes get hot. Like sometimes your hand sticks to them. Okay. So I know a lot of artists that like use gloves. If you've ever seen those little black gloves that like go on your pinky or your two, mm -hmm. your pinky and your ring finger. I like to kind of make it have a little bit of a different uh, motion. Is asking to see my light settings. I'm not. I don't have any light settings. I'm just using a different Mac cap. Hmm. I think Alex is using a Mac cap as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Feeling like your work is not original, yeah, that, that's definitely something that can be a progress killer. You know, like just feeling like, eh, whatever. Oh, this, I've done this myself many times <laughs> where I accidentally, I'll straight up accidentally sculpt something I've seen before, not be mm -hmm. conscious of it. Like, oh, this is cool. You know, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. This is looking great. Uh, and then I get to the end and I'm like, oh, or, or somebody else, the worst is actually when somebody else gives you the feedback and they're like oh that's cool that looks like it's from this and you're like what you mean it's from this like, oh yeah this looks it reminds me of this thing that i've seen oh i thought i was making something original but what does original even mean it's a good point i i don't think that the I think the only people that seriously think about being original are people in the fine art gallery space Mm. And they think about it, but the result of that is that it's so difficult to be original that it causes a lot of stress. And so I think in the entertainment world, everything's derivative, you know? And so mm -hmm. I think the idea of being original is something that you really shouldn't worry too much about. Just be you. You are yourself. You are different than somebody else. If you love, you know creatures and you're going to study nature you're being derivative you're not being original but the thing is by studying scores of creatures and then making your own creature that will become a unique amalgamation of all the creatures you've ever seen which will then therefore be original but it's still inspired by nature mm -hmm. you know um but the idea of doing something nobody's ever seen before um what does that mean you know it's like don't don't try that's not what studios are necessarily looking for because the stuff you're going to be asked to do is generally stuff people have seen before as far as the concept right it's mm -hmm. a it's a dragon it's a knight it's a barbarian it's a futuristic city but you'll still try and do new shapes that maybe are unique and form la a form language that maybe is novel, but it's not something to worry too much about, especially if you're you know, a student, because you're going to be applying for junior positions where ultimately that's not really something you need to be too concerned with. No, not, not really at all, actually. So I think most artists, if you said, you know, are you original? They would they would be able to talk about all their inspirations. Mm -hmm. you know? Where do you see the technology going in the next few years? 
That's an interesting one. That's a hard one to predict. It is, but I think I mean, we've seen the rise of, you know, GPU rendering cause thing or GPUs in general and parallel processing on multiple cores allow things to get more interactive. Mm -hmm. So what I've seen over the last many years of software is that things become software becomes more intuitive. You know, so it doesn't mean it's easy, right? Because there's a lot of programs and learning all of them takes time and, you know, it's technical, but they all become more intuitive over time. You know, like that program Embergen I showed a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. because of the performance being GPU based, it's a far more intuitive way to work because you're getting instant feedback. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that uh, will continue to improve is that as you know, GPUs get better, then your ability to do work will require less and less stuff that's maybe tedious. Like think about what it was like to do UVs back in the day or retopologize things mm -hmm. back in the day and then new tools come across. So I think, you know, this whole AI thing is going to be very interesting on its ability to do certain, help you on certain rote tasks. Yeah. I think you're saying, like exactly what you're saying, the, um, I think the AI is going to speed up a lot of the things that people don't enjoy doing. I think it's going to make it a lot easier and a lot more interactive and a lot more fun, I think, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Focus on different things. Uh, that's, that's kind of what I would see generally happening is, is um, just, I mean, you can look at many programs, but for me, probably the biggest one is going to, I mean, GPU rendering is obviously a huge part, but just watching of the sculpting, sculpting as a job digitally was was not really a major part of production 15 years ago. You know, 10 years right. ago, it was becoming it. Now it's like a huge different element of it. And uh, that's software, that's you know, different types of innovations coming. And so I think GPU is going to add more things like that where it's easier to use, it's more fun to use, it's a bunch of different things all at once. But I think it's it's exciting. I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, everything's gotten easier, which means that uh, you know, I mean, like back back in the day, to make an image, you know, might take weeks, and now you have people like Beeple who bangs out an image every day. Mm -hmm. You know, which is uh, just a sign that the technology has gotten more and more uh, user friendly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we have about eight minutes left in our stream, Alex. And so uh, we're getting there. I think yeah, your guys' head uh, came along pretty good. I don't know. <laughs> You're not sure yet? <laughs> Still in the ugly face? Sure at all. So I, I apologize <laughs> for everybody watching. I think it's getting there. Yeah, I mean, I'm new to the streaming thing, so like talking and thinking, yeah, uh, you know, like it's. I do think it'd be a lot easier if I like had a concept already, as opposed mm -hmm. to just winging it on this head. But oh, my, do my dogs just—they uh, know, they know decided. it's almost one. Start barking. And I didn't get terribly far either. I kind of got this. I've got shapes, but they're not there yet. Yeah, it's cool. Exos, though. Endo, endoskeleton, exoskeleton, endo. Endo. Exo. So it would be Colin, outside, I guess. Watching tutorials for decades. Uh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Decades, though? Has it been that long? I guess. It's been a cut two decades. <laughs> it's still plural. Yeah. It's weird. It's cool. And uh, David S. David S. Yes, we do reply to questions on YouTube. 
Uh, yeah, we're saying I'm sorry that I'm not looking at the questions as much just because I keep wanting to look and what I'm doing here, but uh, I'm going to scan. I've got an idea for this face, which I'm going to pursue, but I like, so here's my, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this thing is going to have, so I think it should be like fire, like a fire elemental thing. That's how it's powered. So there'd be like a core inside of this area and that could create a bunch of cool glows. And then the eyes and all the mouths and stuff could be like a, uh, like shutters, like it could open and close that way rather than being like an eye. I think that would be like, like it could, no, that's terrifying, but like the shape I was thinking is like it could be more like an iris rather than like an eyeball. So then you could have like a glow, like the eyes would be like glowing all the time in there. That's what I'm thinking. I just realized yeah, that I had to save. Oh, you should definitely save. Along with me. We didn't have our chat support uh, telling us to save this time. Remember that was some. There was somebody last time who was telling us to save every fifteen minutes. Um, need like a, a time, like an alarm we, bell. We need that person back because I <laughs> just lost everything. Maybe that would have been okay. I don't know. <laughs> it's always better the second star, time. Right? I'm starting to not hate it. That's a good point. That's a good turn, though. <laughs> <laughs> when you're like, oh, yeah, there we go. I'm, I can see what it c could or will turn into. There you go. Miranda just came in. Thank you, Miranda. <laughs> Forget to save. Well, thank you, Alpha Matt. Yeah, I think that's very kind. All right. I know where I'm going to take this, but I think it's moving along. See potential. See, if only my internet had behaved, I'd be an hour <laughs> further Yeah, there along. you go. That's true. What does it look like with the full costume? I think it's working. Yeah, I mean, I'll think I'll probably just continue to work my way down until I just, mm. you know, maybe replace the whole thing. Yeah. You know, but just use this as stand-in body for now, just so I've got something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the silhouette you're creating with the horns is helping a lot also to make it pop off the out of the jacket. I think that's a cool... Part of it. All right. Well, I guess that's where that's where we're ending for today. I'm gonna save this thing too. Do just one more hands. save. All right. There and go. then uh, lunchtime, man, my shoulder is so sore, by the way. Is it today? Today. Yeah, it's like we both woke up this morning and just like, I can't, I can't go on my left side. So <laughs> it's, just, it's uh, just crazy, crazy sore from the talking about the vaccine shot. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. got a first shot yesterday and totally fine last night. And then, yeah, this morning, it's like, wow, my, my shoulder hurts. <laughs> like, I'm glad I haven't done my great. left arm on my right since I'm right-handed. Yeah, absolutely. But, all right. Well, thank yeah. you, everybody, for hanging out with us. Thank you, Josh, for of course it's all going and sorry for uh showing up late oh i think it's fine all right everybody well thank you so much it is one o'clock so we're gonna head out for today uh we'll be here again next week 10 to 1 kind of doing some some artwork i think we're gonna con continue i'm gonna try to continue this project i want to finish this one so uh let's we'll see you next week 10 to 1 indeed all right everybody cool. have a wonderful day and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thank y'all. Have a good one. Right. Later. Bye.